Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. We've got a lot of great stories and our first story of the day is from Finney MC, cutting travel costs the wrong way. This is from about 15 years back. I was working in Brussels but had to be in the head office in Frankfurt quite a bit. Now there's three ways to get from my home to Frankfurt, which is about 200 meters or 320 kilometers, by car, by train, or by plane. I was already told that I couldn't use my car because they would have to pay me a pretty decent amount per kilometer driven, so I used to go by high speed train. Very easy, I would walk to my station, take a train to the HST station, take the high speed train to Frankfurt, take the S-Bahn tram to my hotel and workplace. The only luxury I afforded was a first class ticket, because the first time I did this I had a second class ticket, found a woman and a toddler in my reserved seat that made a complete mess and refused to move, so I ended up standing for almost an hour in the little open space at the end of the wagon. Also, when ordered in advance, the price difference wasn't even that large, like 20 euro. Okay, we're almost a year later. I'm still zipping between the two cities by train in first class when I get a mail from HR informing me I'm violating the travel rules and they won't pay back my expenses next time. I ask them what the rules are. The reply I get is a link that says, either a second class train ticket or an economy flight. I ask them if exceptions can be made. They reply, no. So the next time they expect me in Frankfurt, I book a plane ticket, which is because it's between Brussels, capital of the EU, and Frankfurt, European Central Bank, hilariously expensive. On top of that, as per travel rules, I add a cost per kilometer for driving my own car to the airport and back, the parking fee for 5 days, and an S-Bahn ticket. In all, I had to spend about 5 times more than the most expensive train ticket to that date. I received my exception to travel in first class about a week later. You gotta love when companies are so stuck to whatever budget. They can't make any exceptions, they can't work with you to offset the cost of the upgrade, they just want you to sit in that cheapest crappy seat and accept that you're gonna be miserable every time you gotta go out to the office. If they're gonna shortchange you like that, the obvious retaliation is just trying to make them end up spending way more than they would have because OP was already doing the most reasonable thing, just making it a little bit nicer for them. If you're gonna literally nickel and dime me like that, okay, I'll nickel and dime you right back. Our next story is from Who Skewed a Pooch. Forget everything about this place? A malicious compliance over a decade in the making. Many years ago, I worked for a little company. CEO was a miser of the first order. We needed image hosting for a large client account, and CEO was unwilling to pay for maybe two to three thousand dollars in annual image hosting fees at the time. Even though the company made millions off of the deal, me being an enterprising individual, I figured out a way to host the images on Flickr. I saved the login information in a physical notebook and kept informing them that this is a house of cards and we really need to switch to a professional service. Several months later, I was promoted and asked for a raise to go with my promotion. CEO said no. All promotions and raises require CEO sign-off. I tried negotiating, but CEO said no, and to leave if I didn't like it. So I left. CEO told me to forget everything related to the job here, and he'd sue me if I did anything with the client accounts afterwards, i.e. sabotage or steal clients. I told him I'm leaving all my knowledge behind in the notebook and my final email to him, my manager, and BCC'd my personal email. In this email, a full inventory of what I left behind, invoices, contracts, etc., including this entry, personal notebook, account notes and reference material, including image hosting logins, per so-and-so accounts, keep for reference. Recently I received a professional networking site message from the CEO telling me to help them with my old accounts or he'll sue me. Apparently Flickr changed their term of service and the images were deleted. In over 10 years, nobody updated any documentation or the image hosting. Nobody bothered checking the email account either that was used to log into the Flickr account. I told him that I can't help. Per his request, I forgot everything I knew about his company and anything I knew was in that notebook I left him over 10 years ago. Seriously though, I don't remember what I had for breakfast. Technical details from that long ago? I just laugh. 
I mean, yeah, what does the CEO expect? 10 years after you stopped working there? They're gonna call you up about a Flickr account that you had for the company? How is anybody going to remember a company password they used 10 years ago? I mean, some people might remember it, but I feel like it's more than understandable if you forget literally everything about that job. Especially considering it's a former workplace, you probably aren't too enthused about all the work that you did there, so you're not going to be keeping up on it and thinking about it every so often to keep it fresh in your brain after 10 years. That's all long gone. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every single video has awesome stories like our next story from Red Vox Fox, Sick Leave Documentation. Just spent a week in the ICU and a week recovering. Boss told me to get better and take the time I need. I have about four months of accumulated paid leave, sick plus vacation. I had planned to return to work this week. I headed to the doctor today for a follow-up. Boss texts that I need to either return to work tomorrow or provide medical documentation. It turned quickly adversarial and HR is now involved. We all know that HR protects the employer. Cue malicious compliance. Doctor says he wants me completely off work and focusing on rehabilitation for at least six more weeks. Provides documents stating so, addressed to my boss and my HR department with a threat slash warning that violating his medical orders may constitute reckless endangerment against medical advice and may subject both the employer and them each personally to civil and criminal liability, citing state and federal laws. Wow, I love this doctor and clinic. Well, I know one thing's for sure. The doctor and clinic that OP is going to has their stuff on straight. And not only that, but you can tell they got your back, which is more than enough to make you feel comfortable showing up there again in the future. This next story is from Gritman02, The Toilet Seat. So my wife and I have been married for almost 18 years. When we first met, I was a work in progress. Leaving cabinets open, letting dishes soak, putting the toilet paper on the holder the wrong way, etc. I'm still amazed that she's still with me. Most of the things I admit I was wrong or okay compromising to make us happy. One thing that I didn't want to compromise on was putting the toilet seat down after using the toilet. She didn't lift it up after she used it, so why would I put it down? We had several small arguments about this. I soon realized I was never going to win. So since then, I've not only put the seat down, but also the seat cover down. So she has to at least lift it before she uses the toilet small victories. Now, I don't know if this is controversial, but I think ultimately that's probably the right way to handle toilet etiquette anyways. I'm not gonna lie, I don't actually follow it myself, but I don't actually share a bathroom with anybody at the moment. But if you do share a bathroom, honestly, I think putting the seat down after you go every time is probably the best etiquette. Our next story is from New England Noir. I crossed my eyes on purpose and all my dad's wedding photos. It was 1996. I was 12 and felt very dependent on my glasses, like panicked without them, security blanket style, especially during the chubby, zitty years. My dad's girlfriend, on the other hand, hated my glasses and was not shy about letting me know how dorky they were and how contact lenses could really improve things looks-wise. She insisted I remove them for wedding photos, but I protested. I claimed that my astigmatism gave me a slight lazy eye. A lie, but I can drift cross my eyes one at a time, so she believed me and asked to keep them on. She however decided I could just concentrate for a couple of minutes without them. I was pissed that I couldn't look like myself in the photos, especially because the glasses weren't clunky or bold like the trendy ones today, just plain small gold ovals. It was declared BS by everyone, and most people were team glasses, but my stepmom was the bride? So she ultimately pulled the, but it's my wedding card and got her way. No glasses. So in a true fit of tween righteousness and peak, every time they asked me to be in a photo on their wedding day, I removed my glasses and I crossed my eyes almost completely. Not one photo of me exists from that day. I won, petty but satisfying, even 25 years later. Today, teenagers, feel free to borrow and replicate. It's not really related to OP story, but this kind of makes me think of back when I was a kid, I got glasses probably around the time I was in third grade. 
and for a while, almost every year when picture day would roll around in school, I always wanted to try to make sure I never wore glasses for some reason. I think I was able to stick with that tradition all the way up till maybe even like 6th or 7th grade. At some point, I think the guy taking the photos was just so quick that I didn't have any time to think about it. And, I mean, it was just a part of how I always looked regularly anyways, and I kind of resigned to my fate. This next story is from Family Money Time. You have to get this fixed. Um, no, you will have to get it fixed. Okay, this is a second-hand story from a workmate. Happened in the 90s with a major oil and gas provider. We will call this Mob Company X. For the purpose of this story, my workmate will be called Jono. He worked for a contracting company which deals with servicing equipment for said company X. Like many other industries, company X contracted out a lot of their jobs to many service providers, many of which mobilized office staff to the major field facilities provided by company X. Upon winning contracts from company X, service providers either build office buildings in company X's land or moved into existing buildings that belonged to Company X. This is important to know for later. Back in the 90s, there was a massive push for job safety and industry safe conditions and safe work conditions. With the push, new safety staff in Company X were hired, with the mentality of changing the industry with an iron fist. It's our way or forfeit the terms in your contract and get the boot. When these safety guys came in, they started shaking up every nook and cranny. First, the service provider had their operations shut down for two weeks due to a lack of operational guidelines. The second company was told their building was a fire hazard and their chemical storage was a mess. Three weeks to get it fixed before the service provider could get back up and running. Fast forward to Jono and their provider. At this point, safety was on a roll, making the whole industry safe at the cost of the service provider's sanity and work hours, pretty much throwing their weight for everyone to catch. When it was their two-week period for a safety audit, the safety auditor had developed a multiple-item checklist that they found wrong with other service providers. During the whole two-week audit, they were hit with pretty much everything wrong in the workplace, with the building, the chemical storage, and other menial items so much that the auditor brought in the safety head manager of Company X to talk to Jono and his manager about the sorry state of the workplace. They pretty much said, if you don't get it all changed and fixed, you'll lose the contract for unsafe work conditions. Jono was pretty much losing his crap at this point, didn't know where to start, but his manager took the list and read through it, they handed it back to the safety auditor. With a massive grin on his face, he said, This is a Company X building. We rent off of Company X for the facilities and the workplace. Since you started your safety audit six months ago, I've been requesting to Company X upper management for an upgrade of facilities. But to no avail, they pushed back. Now that we have to shut down due to an unsafe workplace that Company X is unable to provide, We'll have to stop servicing equipment that maintains the operation of over 500 gas wells, effectively shutting down over 50% of all gas production in this area. Note, Company X was and still is a major natural gas provider. If there was a potential risk of losing 50% of all gas production, often someone's gonna get the boot. The safety manager was all deflated and didn't have anything to say. The auditor replied with, We'll have to come back and research what the conditions of the lease agreement in your contract is before we can continue. In the end, it took Company X one month to fix everything in John O's workplace. They pretty much got away scot-free. There must have been a massive meeting or something, cause all the auditors prioritized that building that belonged to Company X, and got their building fixed. I mean, in all fairness though, although they did back themselves into a very expensive corner, and they were seemingly so happy to crack down on OP until they realized it was their own company, at least they did actually go and fix up those places in regards to whatever safety issues were existing. You know, I wouldn't doubt that there would be a lot of companies out there that would find a way to get these auditors to come back and say, you know what, under second review, this place is safe enough and you'll be able to continue your operations for the foreseen future. And then you knowing you gotta go back to work, 
when there was actually a bunch of critical safety issues found. Like, let's give them credit, they did actually fix it. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another malicious compliance story that was even more insane than the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, click on the right. But with that said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.